Right. Um, welcome to this special session. Uh, this has been set up or uh, put together uh, to celebrate Klaus's contributions to economics uh, in the past three to four decades. Um, Klaus, as you probably, some of you know already, turned 70 today. Um, so this is a, a session we thought, or I thought should you know, kind of dedicate uh, to close his work. Um, so part of the celebration is in the selection of the papers uh, on migration and identity in which Klaus has made uh, um, significant contribution, um, but also thought there should be some more specific acknowledgement of his overall contributions to economics. Uh, now the challenge is that we have only about five minutes to do that, uh, to kind of um, compress everything in five minutes in the last three of th last three to four decades of contribution. And this is uh, this was obviously a quite a challenging task, uh, which I didn't want to take. So I politely asked um, someone who uh, within our group, uh, someone who knows uh, or who has known Klaus for a very long time. And uh, he politely and very nicely agreed to me uh, with me and uh, over to you, Ira, for uh, for that task. <laughs> Thank you, Matlub. So I had to check when I first met Klaus to make sure I was the first person, at least among this group, who, who met him. And I knew that I first met him first uh, in the late 80s, 1980s, when he was visiting Penn, University of Pennsylvania, where he's a visiting associate professor. Uh, and uh, looking at Klaus's uh, CV, which was the only place I could get a, you know, year by year accounting, I saw that I first met him in 1987. He came, actually came and gave a, a talk at Rutgers uh, about a year after I got there. And the second time, which is more significant, uh, was in September of 88, a month when he was visiting the University of uh, Pennsylvania again. And um, the reason I know that and why it's significant is that uh, I was down at Penn, I gave a talk. Uh, after the talk, I walked in the hallway and I ran into Klaus, who apologized for missing the talk. Um, but he had been busy in activities, he explained, promoting a new journal. And to prove his point, he handed me a freshly minted flyer introducing the Journal of Population Economics and suggested that I consider it in the future for papers that don't get into the AER or the Journal of Political Economy. Okay. Um, okay, so um, that's my dating. Uh, and brings in the Journal of Population Economics and that we know that Klaus Zimmerman is an institution builder, not just in name, but in the nitty gritty work of the formation of institutions of bringing the right people in to move the institution forward and shaking things up a bit when necessary. To name a few of these institutes, there was Salapo in Munich, his uh, Lehrstuhl there, the Journal of Population Economics, IZA, DIW, and GLOW. Footnote on GLOW, when Klaus was going around talking it up, I sat down with him and said, why? And he looked at me like, what am I talking about? Okay, we need an institution like GLOW, and as usual, he was right. Now, each of these institutions, and the many that I haven't mentioned, have generated large benefits for the world of economics, and obviously connecting people, providing significant value added, helping launch uh, and establish uh, more than a few careers. And he has done this by producing more than his share of academic papers and engaging in the world as a public intellectual. Now, despite what Malub asked me to talk about Klaus's papers is quite difficult, right? There is so much and contributed to so many different areas and subfields. I think the first one that I made use of was on um, the uh, pseudo R squared when you have categorical uh, dependent variable variables. Uh, and then after many, many different subfields, I think it's enough to say 
uh, that he really has laid down and extended the foundation on which we in population economics build with the emphasis on migration, identity, ethnicity, uh, migrants, et cetera. And I think that the line to sum this up is the line that Klaus has picked to use on his webpage, except no limits or borders. Now it is said that at 70 years old, one reaches the age of fullness of years, the beginning of a period of even increased wisdom. And with this, we wish Klaus a happy 70th birthday. Klaus, all good things for your birthday. We wish you many more happy, healthy, and productive years. Happy Thank birthday. you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Iowa. It's nice to, to hear this, uh, in particular in uh, uh, such a nice uh, group I'm working with. Uh, I'm, I like to be together with uh, other researchers and enjoy research and life, of course. And uh, uh, I'm looking forward. I have not yet decided. Once I made uh, it is uh, 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 said something which maybe is a mistake. Uh, years ago, I said uh, one uh, one has to retire at the age of seventy. It was a recommendation for uh, for for German uh, policymakers uh, to increase the retirement age. They didn't follow my advice, at least not yet. <laughs> maybe in a few years, but I mean, it's 60, about sixteen years when Merkel was elected the first time in that year. It was. Uh, so it's a long time ago. Um, so, but now I'm at the age of seventy, and I have to see what I do. This is not a threat. I have to step down tomorrow, but uh, certainly I have to consider, of course, in the long term, what what is fun and uh, what not. But working with people like you, it's it's fun, and uh, as long as I can do this, is I'm happy to do. It. Okay, thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Ira, for, for doing that. And thank you for your words, class. And now let's start with the program um, of uh, what we had on, at least on the system. So Madeline, um, over to you. Uh, 20 minutes, I would say, for presentation, and then we can have seven to eight, 10 minutes um, of questions, maybe about six to seven minutes, rather. Great. I will, will I get this going here, briefly add to Ira's comments of two things about Klaus. First of all, happy birthday. It's not one of my two things. The first one is I remember hearing it more years ago than I care to admit, Magnus Lofstrom describe Klaus as the most entrepreneurial economist in the world. And I think this is absolutely true uh, with the many contributions that Ira mentioned institutionally. Uh, the thing that I would add that Klaus particularly has done for economics is how inclusive he is. And I think that our paper is an example of this in terms of bringing people who are not at, you know, big research research institutions necessarily into the fold when we have contributions to make. And so I very much appreciate you, Klaus. Happy birthday. All right, so Eva is here as well. Um, the paper that she and I have done together with Cynthia Bansack builds on two areas that Klaus has worked on. One is immigrant assimilation, and the second one is an area that Klaus has been doing more and more work on lately about the Chinese economy. And so what this paper has to do with China, I think will become evident very soon. But the paper is about how having a green card or legal permanent resident status affects marriage outcomes in the United States among immigrants. And the question that we ask is whether having this green card, again, it's legal permanent residence, makes immigrants more desirable in the marriage market. So we're gonna look at what happens to their marriage outcomes along two main dimensions, whether they're more likely to get married at all, and of course stay married, uh, and then whether the spousal characteristics change, and in particular, whether having a green card means you have a better spouse in terms of you know more desirable age, education, higher earnings, and so on. Okay. The answer to this question is yes, it does make appear to make immigrants more desirable in some cases, but not all of the immigrants that we look at. So we think it's a somewhat complicated answer, 
And of course, that is always what makes for, we hope, an interesting paper. What we do in this paper is we take a difference in differences approach, as is now incredibly standard in the literature, by exploiting a natural experiment in the United States that made a particular group of immigrants uh, automatically eligible for a U.S. permanent resident visa if they were in the country either on a temporary visa or without a legal status at all. So there was a policy set of policy changes that I'll describe in a minute that occurred that gave this particular group of immigrants green cards. So we're going to look at that group of eligible immigrants before and after the policy changes. So that's our first difference. And we're going to compare for our second difference in the difference in differences approach them to other immigrants who were not automatically eligible for the green cards and to U.S. natives as well. In the interest of my 17 remaining minutes. I'm only going to show you a small subset of the results. We do have a draft of the paper at this point, luckily, um, thanks to Eva and Cynthia. And so we're happy to share that. And it has all of these different control groups and so on. One of the interesting things that came out as we were working on this paper, to a, um, in our opinion, it's interesting, was differences across education groups and sexes or genders. And so we're going to distinguish between what we consider the highly educated, those who have typically already completed college, and the less educated, those who have not, as well as by sex. And the highly educated group was the target of the particular policy changes that we're focusing on. While the less educated were primarily undocumented immigrants who weren't the targeted beneficiaries of the policy change, but were just sort of there and eligible for it as well. So our natural experiment, and this is where we finally get to China here, is the Chinese Student Protection Act in 1992. So after the dramatic events in 1989, uh, the U.S. policy towards China underwent a number of changes. And one of those changes was to allow Chinese nationals present in the United States to remain in the country, regardless of whether they were here, again, on a temporary visa or uh, undocumented. So if you were already present in the United States in 1989, the first thing that happened was that the United States promised to not force people to return. So it was what was called deferred and forced departure. Then, in April 1990, shortly after the 1990 census, wonderful for us, uh, all of these Chinese nationals present in the United States were eligible to apply for work authorization. So people on student visas at the time could only work for their university. So this opened up to them the possibility of working off campus. And then those immigrants who were undocumented now could work for anyone. All of this is before H-1Bs were available as well. Um, so the H-1B program starts rolling out in the early 1990s as well. Then as things wind their way through Congress slowly, uh, in October of 1992, we get the Chinese Student Protection Act, whose name is not as encompassing as the program actually turned out to be, because it was that everyone who was present in the United States in 1990 from China, who was born in China, was automatically eligible for a green card. Some work that Pia Arrhenius and I did um, in 2012 shows that highly educated Chinese nationals appear to have had substantial gains in earnings and employment over the next decade, so between 90 and 2000. But it's only the college graduates, interestingly, those who were primarily Chinese students in 1990 and then were able to stay in the United States. And by 2000, they were doing much better than a control group of other East Asian immigrants. So in that paper, we just looked at labor market outcomes. What this paper does now is go through and look at marriage market outcomes. So here's what we expect to have happened, is that immigrants who were automatically eligible for first to work for any employer at all, and then eligible uh, to stay in the United States permanently, became more desirable spouses. Right? The highly educated were earning more, as well as able to you know, work for anyone. 
um, which makes for a good spouse, right? Who doesn't want to hire an earning spouse? But also, there was no more uncertainty about whether they'd be able to stay in the United States, about whether they'd manage to get a green card, right? They were automatically eligible. And for the undocumented, prior to this policy change, there was no clear route to getting legal status. So this removed the uncertainty. It also allowed those immigrants to sponsor a spouse. So though once they got legal permanent residence, they could have a spouse apply for legal permanent residence as well. And of course, five years later, they were eligible to apply for naturalized citizenship and then could sponsor a spouse very easily. Um, so we think that this might make them more attractive in the marriage market. The other thing is that their preferences and their bargaining position changed. And this particularly maybe applies to the undocumented, but it also might apply to those on temporary visas and that both groups were before these policy changes may be looking for ways to stay in the United States and to acquire legal status. And so they may have been looking before for a spouse through whom they could get permanent residence. Now they no longer needed to do that, right? So that this, you know, not only did these policy changes make these immigrants more desirable, it also really changed their bargaining position and what they themselves were looking for in a potential spouse. So we just find it you know, a very interesting change in a whole bunch of dimensions. So what we look at in the paper are what we call extensive and intensive margins. So the extensive margins, whether you were married. And once we started looking into this, we started realizing there might be some interesting differences on whether you were married with the spouse living with you or married to a spouse living elsewhere. We're also going to look at whether you have a spouse who's what we call chain migration or chain migrant. And this is whether your spouse arrived after 1990. Remember, you had to be in the country in 1990. So whether you're basically brought over a spouse later who is a co-national, so from your same birthplace. So those are our measures on the extensive margin. Then on the intensive margin, we're going to look at these measures of spousal quality, if you will, which is the age difference between you and your spouse, your spouse's level of education, whether your spouse is born in the United States or born in your own country, and then how much your spouse is earning perhaps a measure of quality, at least to labor economists. All right, so we're going to look at a bunch of these different outcomes. We're drawing on a large um, and very disparate literature. One is assorted of matching models, so Becker and Keeley and many others. The second literature that we're drawing on is a small but very high quality literature that has also looked at immigrants and marriage related outcomes. There's this very interesting paper by Ada and co-authors that looks at when immigrants in Italy, when their countries became members of the EU, how those immigrants' marriage market outcomes changed. And Eva has a paper that looks at divorce and marriage among naturalized immigrants naturalized citizen immigrants and finds results, I think, that are consistent with strategic marriage market behavior among immigrants. And she can talk about that later or, you know, refer you to that paper. Then there's a third literature that we're related to looking specifically at un unauthorized or undocumented immigrants and how increases in U.S. immigration enforcement affect who these immigrants marry, whether they become more likely to marry U.S. natives in the hope that that shields them from deportation or to get married at all. And so there are some papers there related to that. We haven't seen anything directly quite on our question, although the ADA paper is the closest. This is all a very interesting literature. We think we make three main contributions to the literature. The first one is this... It, a natural experiment, so a plausibly exogenous source of variation in legal status. This is the Chinese Student Protection Act. And again, it applied to everyone, not just the Chinese students, all Chinese nationals. So we think that's interesting. Right. The second thing is that we're going to get some insight into whether spousal characteristics are changing. And maybe this, this tells us something about strategic marriage market behavior among immigrants and whether these immigrants were compromising on characteristics of spouses before in order to have a route to legal status. The third main contribution that we think we make is the spousal chain migration. 
Uh, looking at once you get legal status, do you bring over a spouse from your own country? And we're not aware of much research um, on this, particularly regarding spouses. Even though that is the single biggest you know, group of the single biggest way through which people receive green cards in the United States is by being a spouse of someone who can sponsor them for a green card. So we think chain migration merits thought. The data that we use are from the 1990 and 2000 census. Um, so it's going you know, to kind of very standard data where we're going to use where you're born, when you came, what's your marital status, including, again, whether you're living with your spouse. We build some marriage market characteristics from the area where you're living um, as controls. And our treatment group is going to be people present in the United States by 1990, but who immigrated between 80 and 90, so not childhood, you know, not early childhood immigrants. Um, we want them to be relatively young, such that their marriage status is likely to change over the 1990s. So we focus on people who are aged 20 to 39 in 1990, and then we follow that cohort a decade later. So their age is 30 to 49 in 2000. Um, we're, I'm going to show you results that compare these Chinese nationals to other East Asian immigrants. So people who were born in Hong Kong, Korea, or Taiwan. And again, in the paper, we do it also comparing them to all immigrants and to U.S. natives as well. All right, so it's young Chinese nationals compared with other East Asians that we're looking at. Very standard difference in differences model where we're going to have a dummy burial for China, dummy burial for year 2000. All I'm going to show you are the estimated coefficients on the interaction between those. So the typical diff and diffs controlling for your demographics, your marriage market, you know, all, all very standard, I think. All right. So results. Our first set of results is looking at, so we're first going to look at marriage outcomes, the extensive margin then the intensive margin. And again, we do everything by sex, and then we do it also for our two education groups. So the first two columns here are showing you from highly educated men, and then the second two columns are showing you these extensive margin results for less educated men. There's a number of things that pop out. Again, these are the diff and diffs coefficients. So this is the Chinese in 2000 relative to other East Asian immigrants comparing that change from 90 to 2000 for the two groups. So the diff and diffs coefficients. So the highly educated men, uh, Chinese men, become more likely to be married compared to other East Asian immigrants. But the big action here is this change in whether they're living with them, married and living with their spouse. There's a big increase in married with your spouse present among the highly educated men, but a drop in married with your spouse living elsewhere. So there's some big family reunification, it looks like, going on and bringing over your spouse. And to look further at chain migration, we look at this variable again of whether your spouse is a co-national and came after 1990. And here, the two education groups of men look similar. And if anything, the coefficients are bigger for the less educated men. Right. So again, what we think this is, is a lot of you got legal status, you brought over a spouse. In the case of highly educated men, they may have already been married to them. For less educated men, it's not quite as clear. It's a smaller sample. Um, they may be newly married as well as bringing over a spouse they were already married to. All right. Looking at women, uh, we see some similarities, but also some differences. For women, again, it looks like that they're reunifying with a spouse. This big drop, a drop as well in married with a spouse absent. Chain migration also increases the bringing over a co-national spouse, but these coefficients are much smaller in magnitude for women than for men. And less educated women, there's more just action here for them than there was for less educated men. So that's an interesting gender difference, we think. All right, then we look at spouse characteristics. So I would think of this as like the intensive margin. What we find is that less educated Chinese men got younger spouses, more educated Chinese men got more educated spouses, less educated men 
their spouses were not more educated. They both married more Chinese women. Um, and then highly educated Chinese men had this increase in the spouse's income. And again, these are all the diff and diffs coefficients. They're all relative to other East Asian immigrants over the decade. So lots of changes in spouse characteristics. And it looks like for highly educated men, they're really getting higher quality, if you will, spouses. For less educated men, they're getting young wives. Maybe that's high quality. Well, oh, Marlene, sorry, four, four minutes. Gonna, yeah. Yes, thank you. All right. So that's what we found there. For women, this is my final table. So I'm wrapping up. Um, although we have many more in the paper that we're happy to share. So for highly educated women, we also find an improvement in spouse characteristics as measured by education. Lots more on the co-nationals. And the highly educated women became less likely to marry U.S. natives who were all of Asian ancestry, more likely to marry basically white men, uh, and those white men earn more. Less educated women, where there was lots of action, they got better educated spouses. And they didn't marry Chinese nationals anymore. They married U white US natives. So basically, these low education Chinese women had big gains in the labor market, uh, in the marriage market. It's very interesting, surprising, and not what we expected. All right. So they got younger, more educated husbands and so on. We results are robust to lots of stuff. We look at pre-trends, blah, 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 blah. Again, we're happy to share the paper. So what do we find? Lots of different marriage market changes uh, for highly educated both men and women. It looks like getting a green card helps them in the marriage market. For less educated Chinese women, it looks like they also benefited. For the less educated Chinese men relative to other East Asian immigrants, there weren't a lot of obvious gains. And this is consistent with what Pia and I found in our earlier paper, that they also didn't get labor market gains. So maybe it's not a surprise that they didn't get marriage market gains. So we certainly you know, welcome feedback on the paper. Um, and that's what, where we are. Great. Thanks very much. Um, questions? <clears throat> Uh, yeah, Klaus? Do you know where these females came? They came from, from, from mainland China or what? what is it? So the control group includes Hong Kong and Taiwan. So I'm using China as very much just mainland China. We don't know where within China, and that would be very interesting that you could think that there were differences in, you know, kind of rural versus urban migrants and so on during this period. I mean, there's, oh. since decades, see, since for many years already, at least 10 years, 20 years, the discussion that uh, high educated uh, uh, Chinese females see the best chance for their life by immigrating and marry a white man. So basically, you are confirming that known hypothesis. Well, interestingly, it's the less educated Chinese women who are marrying the white okay. US men. Um, and, and so, I guess that's, you know, pre presumably preferred by them. And then maybe they're also a very attractive group for some reason to white U.S. Native men. Okay. Interesting. Any, uh, Ira? Yeah, so a couple of other interesting things is that this is the same period, I believe, where China is importing women, you know, for marriage in China because of the outcomes of the one child family and stuff. So that's kind of a multi movement going on. The the other thing is, and you know, it's it's hard to keep track of when the US policies change, but there if you have a green card, right? I don't and you're bringing somebody in for marriage, isn't there some sort of you can't just get the green card or you can't just get your visa. You have to wait three years until you can bring in a bride or a groom. Something like that. Eva. So I think that for, as we show for the highly educated, we think they were already married. So we can't mm -hmm. observe the year of marriage in the data. The census no, doesn't. But even if they're married, there's a delay 
No. I think it's if you get divorced in the first two years, you don't get your green card. So you have to stay married mm -hmm. two years, but, but you get it a provisional one during those kind of two years. And then interestingly, after for three years, you can apply for citizenship that there's this fast track if, if your spouse is a U.S. native. Um, or, sorry, no, not U.S. native, naturalized citizen. Yeah, mm -hmm. sorry. Oop. So, but I think you're referring to the fiance visa. There's like a wait period for which you have to, and that takes a long time depending on where you get married and stuff. That's okay. true. But once you're married, I think that's a, it's a little different. But we're looking at a 10 year difference, right? And I think to Klaus's point, like those people that were looking as the treatment group had already have to been in the US prior to the 1990, right? When things started changing. But one of the reasons why we think the Asian women are gaining in the labor market is that for U.S. citizen men, often they're worried that immigrant women might be wanting to marry them for papers. So if they no longer have this, uh, you know, if they have papers on their own, it might also be easier for, for them to find a partner in the U.S. as well. Okay. So just one more thing. After the 1986 IRCA, Immigration Reform and Control Act, we were over the next I don't know, eight to 10 years, series of legislative moves which broadened IRCA, right? Brought in different groups, sort of into IRCA, extended it to, to people who had been omitted and El Salvadorians and others. So this sounds like it's in the same spirit uh, as this. Well, Nakara, um, so the, the what, 97? Na 96, 97, Nakara did that. Yeah, got a bunch of, I think, Russians and Central Americans who kind of mm. had missed IRCA. They didn't realize that it yeah. wasn't just Mexicans. Um, but this one was very much just Chinese nationals. And it was a response to the student protest movement. Okay. Um, which makes this paper very interesting right now, I mm. hope. Uh, so we certainly yeah. appreciate the thoughts. Yeah, if anything, I, think, I guess that would, that would almost bias our results down, right? If other groups had gains potentially as well and access to papers, because when we use all of the immigrants as a as a control group, we get consistent results. I mean, when you were presenting, I was thinking of Hong Kong in 1997 and uh, having an impact, but but obviously you, con you, you don't consider that as... We didn't uh, do anything in the U.S. for Hong Kong. We let Canada... Uh, be the big yeah, but I think but I think a lot of them are were going for you know for education or whatever. I mean, there was a lot of movement out of Hong Kong, and I thought that you know once they arrived in the U.S., they could have <laughs> looked for a way to stay there, so to speak. Right, but again, we because we restricting our group to be you had to be present in the U.S. by 1990. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, avoiding yeah. that, but that's a good point. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Nancy, what's the last question? Quick one, please. Hi. Okay. Thank you. So um, thank you for the presentation. I also come from Taiwan. I find this super relevant and interesting. Um, just a small question. So uh, have you control those ones that have been espoused or engaged with their other halves before they uh, immigrated in the States? Because from what I know, and being a Taiwanese, those ones who are better off in the first place they are also more likely to be better educated, to be espoused earlier during the 1990s, and also more likely to uh, stay, you know, be able to, to stay in the States. You know, and this is not referring to the policy changes, but to their other qualities, their other abilities of staying in the States. So uh, I was thinking that if they already have been somehow engaged or, you know, like, espouse in a traditional way uh, back then. And after that, uh, they are, uh, of course, there was this change in their social status because of the, the, the new um, uh, entitlement. But then they are actually not necessarily moving up in the marriage market abroad because they are basically just, you know, staying in the same relationship they have been keeping even before immigration, right? Right. So unfortunately, we don't know when the marriage happened. We just know when they immigrated. And so I, we wish the census had asked more questions. Um, mm -hmm. but, but what we find is at least 
to the extent that was happening, it was bigger among the Chinese than among our control groups. Um, and mm -hmm. because we find a lot of this reunification going on, but, but it would be lovely to have more data as always. So yeah. thank you. <laughs> no, thank you. Okay, I think that's uh, it for, for this paper. We can, you know, at the end, we can have more discussion if there's time. Uh, over to you, Ira, um, now talking about your paper instead of Klaus. Yeah, okay. Let me see how I do here. Um, okay, let's try this. And does that work? Yep, all good. Okay, okay, good. Okay, so uh, this paper uh, is with uh, Melanie Thomas and John Landon Lane. It's a paper that we worked on and off developing some of the ideas or the idea, uh, and we put it aside for a year and I'm sort of bringing it back uh, to life with this talk. And the idea is this, we have migration and we have the informal economy, which are both uh, income generating strategies that people follow, particularly in uh, well, all over, but particularly in uh, developing uh, transition economies. Uh, sometimes these are survival strategies. Um, there is, uh, of course, both a tremendous amount of work done independently on migration and independently on uh, the informal economy, the informal sector. Uh, and over time, when you look at informality, um, there's increased recognition about the heterogeneity of the informal economy, um, or at least specific forms of the heterogeneity uh, in terms of differentiating uh, who is in the sector. Most commonly, the uh, way of thinking about it is that there are two main groups. There are those for whom the informal sector is a residual it's where they go uh, as a, you know, a last opportunity when they cannot find any other jobs. Uh, and the other view is that it's a, um, a cauldron of entrepreneurial activity where the, uh, uh, the, the, the people working in their garages come out with uh, new products and uh, new technologies. And, and of course, it's really a mixed picture uh, in the, 1970s and 80s, it's pretty clear that in India, the small textile sector, which had its own modern tiny machines, was actually the more modern uh, technology and what was still considered informal. So there's that type of stuff. Um, okay. So, oh, I got what's wrong with the screen? Yeah, there we go. Okay, so our idea here, though, is to link uh, the idea of migration and informality and talk about how um, migration might crowd out informality. informality. Uh, now, whether that's significant or not depends on what you actually think or what it shows up that the informal sector is doing. Um, and it could work in either direction. If you think the informal sector is a residual sector, then uh, fine, but also if you think that it's an entrepreneurial sector, um, you you might think, oh, that's not so good in that case because uh, at least uh, you, because you're taking out the entrepreneurs and you're letting them all move to a, the U.S. or in our case, Russia. Uh, so a lot of this question will be circles around, uh, and for most papers on informality, on how we assign and how we measure informality. And when we get to the data, or when I get to the data today, we'll be talking about uh, Tajikistan as our uh, as our main case. Tajikistan's a country which in the 21st century uh, had both a large, large share of its population uh, working abroad temporarily, mainly in Russia, excuse me, uh, with also had its own domestic informal economy, okay? Now, 
Um, so what is informal sector activity, informal economic sector economic activity? Well, there's, there's a lot of different definitions in the literature, a lot of different uses. A lot of it depends on the data available and some of it depends on the question you're asking. Uh, although, of course, the data available often limits the types of questions you're asking. Uh, so some really appeals to macroeconomic concepts, right? So you might compare, for example, reported uh, gross domestic product to what you think gross domestic product might be by uh, the actual electricity use in the country. And the difference uh, would be the informal, sometimes a shadow economy, um, or you may have now uh, satellite pictures of night lights to represent, uh, to capture some sort of economic activity. Most uh, informality studies, uh, especially those sponsored or related by international organizations are very much job or firm driven definitions. Are you working in a small firm? So firm size, is it in the unregistered sector versus registered firms? It is the unorganized sector. It's a term used in India. Is it illegal? Uh, are we talking about self-employed own account workers and employers, maybe underemployed? Mm, what types of services? Uh, the ILO and others uh, like to talk about um, whether it's uh, people are covered by legal protections as being informal, sorry, as being formal and not covered as being informal, whether you have access to a provident fund, uh, social protection. Of course, that leads to some interesting data definitions, such as um, if you're in a country which uh, provides everyone with health benefits, with health care, then then either everyone's in the informal sector or not. So it's it's kind of ambiguous there. And I, I have used these um, different definitions for different papers over the years myself. Uh, and Melanie has done some work comparing these different definitions in Mexico uh, and, and what they tell us and what they don't tell us. Uh, one of the big issues I find is that when you use this job-based definition, like in most work, you most academic work, you either look uh, maybe at, at the person's first job, their main job, how they define it, that also usually defines the industry they're in. Sometimes you see papers looking at the second job. But informal work could be somebody's third or fourth or fifth job. They could be moonlighting on weekends. Uh, and that's informal work. Um, and Behind all this is the idea in the discussion is that the informality, the informal sector is really quite murky. And that's often the idea, but that seems to be lost in how uh, our academic work is carried out. Um, so I think that you talk to people, and in fact, there was just a, another big project at WIDER, the World Institute of Development Research, of development economics research up in Helsinki uh, on informality. And there was obviously somewhat of a split even in that project where they came, just came out with a volume where they had a highly structured informal sector, uh, which they then applied that model to several different economies. Uh, so there's little disagreement then on the sense behind what informality is, but there is disagreement on how to capture that sense, um, especially when you have many people participate both in the informal and formal activity. Medical doctors and taxi drivers, for example. Uh, as I said, it could show up in many different jobs. Uh, well, informal income of often multi-source. And, and so what we try here although of course it is not without its problems, is to try and deal a bit more with the murky, to look at households. Um, in fact, I think our approach looks, fits very well in the, in the population economics uh, view of the world, as opposed to an IO uh, view of uh, 
firm organization. Uh, so what we're going to do is, uh, much like some of the macro literature does, but not for informality, we're going to compare uh, income to expenditures in surveys. Um, we're going to infer informal activity. The unit of the household, uh, the unit of analysis is the household, not the individual laborer. Um, informality is, in this sense, a family affair. And, and the bo bottom line is the way we look at it is that if uh, household expenditures exceed household income after accounting for loans, transfers, changes in assets, and other things, then we have a sort of revealed informal activity. Okay, we could introduce a rule. Okay, we could say, yeah, sure, there's lots of other things that this could be. But what if household expenditures are twice household income? What if they're three times? Then I would argue that you could define um, define household expenditure. You could define this difference in some form uh, at some point as informal activity. Now, so the question is this, when households are spending more than their total income, they must be getting it from somewhere. And we're already taking count of loans and transfers, um, remittances. Okay, so perhaps it's informality. Now, what else could this gap be? Well, in the literature, this gap is used for, for uh, is called many different things, often with a lot of a very strong assumptions giving us these definitions, which is fine and proper. So measurement or recall error, usually it's less for expenditure than income. There's a big literature in development, especially with regards to poverty on this. Uh, corruption, bribery, related stuff, the shadow economy, usually depicted as illegal. Uh, it's really what I think of as un unrecorded, uh, re unreported uh, income. Um, and think about this, if we could take this gap and decompose it into these different components, um, that would be great. But often we can't, except with very strong assumptions. But conceptually, at least, all we need is that there should be a monotonic relationship between the gap and informal economic activity. In other words, it should be positively correlated so that as the gap increases, we're pretty sure it's informal activity. And then you could define it as a, you know, a categorical variable, or in this case, we just left it as a continuous, continuous variable. Okay, so... Um, I can see I'm already using up time. So um, so we have total household income in our surveys and we have total household expenditures and many of the surveys have this, of course you have to look at the particular survey and see how detailed the information is, whether you can make these uh, changes and assumptions uh, that we're making. Um, uh, and you of course have the obvious problem that if you do have a household that might clearly be in the informal sector uh, by the nature of the job that um, that's, uh, it, it claims to have, but you have a case where uh, income is equal to expenditure, then they get washed out of our, of our uh, definition. Okay, so we're working on that as well. Uh, and in the data we use, we convert everything into the monthly equivalent. Um, okay, so we talked about Tajikistan. Tajika said in this period, 2007 to 2011, um, it's the most remittance dependent country in the world. In 2012, it was 50% of GNP, GDP. One third of the labor force is involved in migration, uh, mainly to Russia, often in the construction industry or other issues. I am not talking about the migrants' informal work in Russia or other places. We're talking about informality back in Tajikistan. Okay, uh, it was poor, it's landlocked. It's got a population like New Jersey, about 7 million. Okay, life expectancy 68. It's really the poorest or almost the poorest of the former Soviet republics. 
Okay. The data we use uh, is a 2007 and 2009 Tajikistan Living Standards Measurement Survey, LSMS, and the 2011 uh, Tajikistan Household Panel Survey, uh, which was uh, run by the by IOS in Regensburg, uh, the basically the former East-West Center. Uh, and um, what they managed to do was get the same information from the bank, from the World Bank, uh, and we're able to go to the same subset of households uh, in 2011 that made up the panel part of the 2007 and 2009 um, survey. So basically you have a, a panel where each okay you have a panel over these over this six year period okay the migrants here are uh, defined uh, as those who uh, worked abroad and returned home in the last twelve months which is most of them uh, the most of the Sorry, immigration four, four minutes uh... okay fine I'm actually going to make it most of the immigration is uh, this temporary immigration uh, often with multiple trips. Okay, uh, so we craft this panel. And just to quickly show you, if you look at these, we see the, the solid line is is expenditure distribution, the, the kernel densities and the dotted lines income. And we see that in all three years, it exceeds it. Um, if we identify four types of households, uh, those with migrants abroad, that is current migrants, we have those with all the migrants who've gone abroad have returned. We have those uh, with both current migrants abroad and return migrants, so a migrant family, and those with no migrant experience. And what we can see is, again, always expenditures to the right, pretty much, but the migrant family has most overlap, uh, and the return migrant has the least, which means it has the largest gap. And in fact, uh, if we divide it into those with migrant experience versus households with none, we can see that the gap is highest among those with none. And in fact, if we combine those two diagrams, we see that the pattern of, of expenditures is the same for both migrant and non-migrant households. But of income, it's quite different with this one that's to the right over here being for uh, migrant households. Okay, so we run regressions. Let's just go right to this um, complete one here where we have uh, current migrant, return migrant, migrant family, um, non-migrant households are the um, are the excluded group. Okay, we have uh, confounding factors. We have uh, household fixed effects, and we also have time invariant uh, time and not time cases. And so when we look at the basic regression results in this panel, fixed effect panel analysis, what do we find? We find that, well, all three of these migrant relative to non-migrant results show that this gap of uh, dependent variable is the, um, the, expenditure, the expenditure minus income gap, the log of that. It shows that the gap is closed by migration, okay? Uh, that the, um, and it's it closed the least in households that have return migrants and most in migrant families, just like we'd expect. And this varies by uh, rural and urban with it being much smaller, much less relevant in and urban, much more relevant in rural areas, but we can also see uh, that mo most of the migrants come from the rural areas. And this is true with or without taking account of time. And basically this is true in every other specification we could deal with. And we looked at quantile regressions. We looked at a more direct consideration of remittances. We looked at regional variations, it turns out, that's the very little and what we do find are really captured by our distinction between urban and rural. We looked separately at expenditure and income. 
uh, in terms of migration status effect on expenditure, almost done. On uh, on income, yeah, it seems to drive the gap. We um, uh, we we considered endogeneity, and we made the argument that um, you know to say that this gap causes migration. We found that it's difficult, but uh, but it's also difficult to convince people. So that's exactly where we are working right now. Um, there's an issue of selection, and we had another, we, we actually approached this, we thought, with a rather simple um, situation with arrangement, which is we first looked at, what we did was looked at um, all the households that had some relation to migration, where there should not be a selection issue. And what we found was those results were the same as for the non-migrant, for our later results. So we, where we included non-migrants. And, and so that gave us an indication that selection was a major issue, but we're also working on uh, strengthening that argument. Okay, uh, so our conclusions, um, expenditures are greater than income in general. Well, for migrant households, the patterns are different. We find negative uh, significant correlations between informal activities and migration. Uh, the gap between expenditure and income falls in the presence of migration. Uh, these are robust across uh, different specification, suggesting that unreported income, whatever its source, uh, and we argue it's a large part is informality, uh, is being replaced with uh, reported remittances uh, from migrants so that it can be argued that migration may be crowding out informality. End of story. Okay, thank you, Fira. Um, questions? So could I just uh, maybe start? Um, one of the things that you you talked about was that you control for transfers uh, in this, uh, I mean, one of the elements of uh, migration from Tajikistan uh, has been that there was quite a lot of short-term migration as well, especially because the right. uh, restrictions are, there are no restrictions in a way other than just registering when they go to Russia. So there was quite a bit of back and forth. So you, you didn't have really any formal transfers taking place. It was much more kind of retained savings coming back. Well, um, yeah, my... that's, that's included and that's, they, okay, do, yeah. they do go over the people as they enter the country pretty thoroughly uh, on the trains or planes or whatever to see if they're carrying any currency or other sorts. Okay, um, because my understanding was in that in that um, household data that you're using, um, the, the remittances are actually just the formal transfer that they're recording in there. Or is it is it also they are capturing um, this? Well, this my understanding well. was that I uh, so we see one of the things you may have noticed is that I did not include an explicit remittance variable for yeah, two yeah, reasons. Yeah. One is I'm not sure. Two is anytime I include a story, an estimation for migration and remittances in the same analysis. It's hard to identify what's going on because mm. they go together, and um, yeah. So I just I just don't know. Uh, but yeah. my you know my understanding was, but I don't know. I have to you know since I think you may have used this data. Um, when I talk to people at iOS who talk to the people who collected the data, it was hard to get a clean answer. Yeah, that's uh, it, it, this is this was I remember uh, World Bank wasn't it was World Bank collected the data or uh, they yeah. hired they hired the company to collect the data. yeah sure yeah 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 sure um, any anybody else any other questions well, so, my, migration is migration to 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 Russia yes mainly yes yeah mainly. and I can throw out the people who go to. Ukraine, <laughs> uh, and and get the same same results. 
Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so there's no difference. So, okay, okay, yeah. thanks. Madeline. Iro, if you look at differences in, I don't know, hours worked or uh, how many people in the household are working, does it help it? Is it consistent with this pattern of differences between expenditures and reported income? You know, I, didn't, I honestly, I didn't really, I didn't look at that. That's a good idea. Uh, uh, the It would be interesting. We did look at some other, you know, other issues. And one of the ideas was to try and define a two-worker household with no children and how of domestic and how close their income works to expenditures. And it was much closer. Okay, so yeah, and you know, it could be that it's the other person, the one who's not working, who doesn't report hours, who's actually doing the informal work, you know, in the local market. Um, so there's going to be some ambiguity. It's problematic, but I'll tell you, and I, I know people, if you look at any of the other approaches that I talked about, Okay, that people have used for informality, each of them have problems that I would argue is just as great, but we've accepted those approaches. Mm -hmm. We've got used to those patterns. Okay. So, and I just finished a paper on that using one of those other approaches. So any any other question? Just just a very short comment about Tajikistan. I, I did some work for DFID many years ago and spoke with their um, labor minister and my, they have a migration minister as well. And their whole development strategy was based on preparing people to migrate. There was nothing else in the development policy other than preparing people to migrate. So there's <laughs> so that that's uh, partly also, I mean, because of that policy, I suppose it's 50% oh. because it was 50%. So let me just, sorry, add one point, okay? And that is what we found also was that if you look at the people who are professional education, that is higher high school and university, they don't migrate. Yeah. But they do have a big gap between their income and their expenditure. And these are people who, for example, are the doctors, lawyers, and it took me a long time to wrap my head about this because this is not what we think of in development. But if you're in a former non-market economy where medicine's in the public sector, you see patients on the weekend at home. Yeah, I think, this, and this was true. In we did some work in Moldova as well. It is because okay. of the tax structure because they. The, the tax structure is such that in a way it's easier to do ca cash in hand kind of seeing patients over the weekend rather than rather than actually um, you know declaring them anyway we, we we have to stop now it's really a fascinating discussion um so we have we have gone from us slash china to tajikistan and now we are going back to china uh, where she is going to talk about social assimilation and labor market outcomes uh, within china um, so over to you, Shu. Okay, thank you. So before my presentation, I also was the first to have birthday to class. Uh, and the second, uh, um, about this paper, actually around six or five years ago, when class visit uh, Jinnan University, our institute, uh, I talk. Uh, I talk with him about uh, the in initial uh, rough idea about this project, and the course mentioned some very important uh, about uh, the key of this paper is why social assimilation or social identity would be important uh, for uh, in uh, for for internal migrants of China because. Uh, we can think of across country migrants for across country migrants, assimilation would be uh, important because there are different cultures, uh, different countries. But uh, for within a country, 
uh, internal migration, why for them uh, social assimilation or identity will be important? I think uh, he raised a very important question and inspired me about uh, further to conduct uh, this, uh, this research. And uh, before he leave, uh, he sent me a book he edited uh, on migration with his signature. Uh, so I'm so lucky to have the opportunity to uh, cause uh, this course on this uh, very interesting uh, topic, what, uh, what I really like the experience of it. So as I said, this paper is about uh, uh, social assimilation and the labor um, market outcomes of internal migrants, uh, internal migrant workers. There's a long lasting uh, literature talking about the economic simulation of immigrants by looking at the uh, clothing, the wage gap with natives. However, much less uh, works on the social assimilation, although it's quite important since uh, many of the phenomena cannot easily be explained uh, uh, by economic simulation. As uh, Akulov and Compton uh, said, uh, identity can be quite important uh, in economic decisions. Uh, although there are now a rising uh, literature, sorry, a rising literature working on uh, the impact of social identity or social simulation on uh, economic outcomes of migrants. However, most of these studies focusing on international migration, uh, where the studies on internal migrants is quite limited. So this study aims to close this evidence gap. Uh, by looking at uh, the impact of social identity on internal migrants of China. There are, there are several challenges for this study. First of all, it's uh, about the causality. So as we know, there are uh, economic simulation and social simulation. Their interaction can be uh, run in either way. And uh, Identity, for example, identity uh, may have positive correlation with uh, employment may simply due to some omitting variables or reverse causality uh, or even measurement errors. Uh, but uh, there, there are several uh, pioneer studies looking at the association uh, of uh, for in international migrants. Uh, although based on the existing uh, uh, studies, the conclusion is not uh, is, is is inconclusive. Some of them find uh, there are positive association, and uh, some others find that there's no significant correlation or even causal impact. Another challenge is about uh, the mechanisms. Uh, so, as uh, being emphasized in the theory, network can play important role uh, through which social identity may affect. Uh, labor market outcomes, but few empirical evidence. Um, therefore, this study tries to contribute to the literature by providing some plausible causal evidence on how identity may affect labor market outcomes for internal migrants. And uh, we identify the uh, plausible exogeneity of, of, of identity from the cultural difference between the destination and the original uh, places. Uh, and uh, we find that local, ident uh, local identity may, fully, uh, fully, uh, may help the migrants to, get to achieve higher hourly wage and uh, having lower uh, hours uh, where they remain their monthly earnings unchanged. And uh, we also highlight the law of local networks on explaining these effects we find migrants with stronger local identity are more likely to use local uh, uh, network in job searching and to achieve high quality jobs. I think for those who are not that familiar with China and Chinese migration, uh, I'd order to take this opportunity to uh, talk a little bit about it. Uh, the China's, uh, there's a massive uh, flow of internal migration within China, especially from rural to urban areas, uh, usually from the interior to the coastal areas. In terms of size, actually, it's quite huge. 
as provided by the National uh, Bureau of Statistics. In one single year, in 2013, there are estimated 245 million migrants uh, within China. This is about 10 times the size of immigration during the age of mass migration, and even 40 times the size of great migration of the southbound African Americans uh, to the urban north uh, between uh, 1910 to 1970. And um, so it's a, uh, it, it's, it's a huge in terms of size, but uh, it's less, uh, not that uh, well studied in the literature. And, uh, and uh, another thing is, is difficult, uh, uh, difficulties of social assimilation for these migrants, actually due to cultural diversity and uh, for institutional barriers such as Foucault system. And in this study, we emphasize on the cultural difference uh, between the host and the, the original places much, uh, that may hinder their social simulation uh, in the destination uh, places. Although we talk about uh, 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 talk about the institutional restrictions and we control for them in most of, uh, take account of them in most of the analysis. And another aspect of the background is a dialect in China. So when I say dialect, it's a little bit, it's a little bit different from, uh, from, from language because in China, there's a unified written system. Uh, all people within China using the same Chinese characteristics. Well, spoken language varies substantially across regions, most based on the dialects. Uh, we think similarity of dialects um, between regions is informative about the history in the next, uh, in interaction uh, and uh, indicates similarity in cultural identity. So we, we, we try to use the similarity in dialects to indicate the, uh, the cultural similarity and to investigate, to employ this variation uh, on the uh, identity. We're using the data from dynamic monitoring survey of migrant population in China in 2013. So this, so, uh, this is a very uh, unique data in the sense that it collects a very detailed information uh, for migrants especially for the labor market outcomes, as well as their assimilation uh, at the destination places. And uh, another way is, is rep, uh, it's representative in, uh, for, for, for migrants. Uh, we've seen that it's coming from eight pro uh, prefectures, about uh, 68 counties uh, within China, and uh, focusing on the migrants who, uh, who are aged between 15 to 59. We focus on employees uh, and uh, we address the potential sample selection in a robustness checks. And uh, this map uh, illustrates uh, the uh, sampled counties and the prefect uh, sampled prefectures within this study. And uh, in terms of linguistic data, we we, uh, which is based on the uh, local dialects from Chinese dialect dictionary. And uh, it uh, classifies the Chinese dialect into 10 dialectual supergroups, 20 dialectual groups, and uh, around 100 subgroups. And uh, classify each of the county in China to a uh, dialectal subgroup. And uh, we, based on this, uh, this data within hand, we measure the linguistic distance between county pairs. And we code, uh, code this uh, with increasing order to indicate uh, larger linguistic distance or less linguistic similarity. It is worth to note that uh, it's a pairwise measure of similarity of linguistic characteristics between dialects. And we using this data uh, as a, mainly as an instrument for our main variable, which is self-identity. Self -identity. It is based on a question asking the respondent 
which of the foreign type of identity do you think you belong to? And the answers to this question, including local citizen, uh, new local citizen, or the citizen of your township, or do not know. We classify those who are, whose answer is local citizen or new local citizen uh, as assimilated, uh, as based on the literature, and the others are uh, unsimulated. Uh, there's a very limited, a uh, very few uh, sample uh, say they don't know, and we think don't know may be classified as marginalized or integrated and uh, different from inter uh, international migrants. And uh, this is actually quite small group uh, for internal migrants in China. Therefore, we measure a dummy variable which it was one if the answer is local citizen or new local citizen, or we call it uh, assimilated in terms of self-identity. And in the sample, about 45% uh, of the migrants consider the affiliate with the host region. This figure oh. shows the law distribution oh. 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 groups who are uh, fear belonging to the local citizen versus the who do not feeling they belong to the local citizen. So the solid line are those accelerated migrants. As you can see from panel one, the distribution in terms of average hour worked uh, totally shift left world. Uh, as in contrast, when we look at hourly wage, the distribution of the soil line shift left worlds uh, for the assumed migrants. This provides some uh, law uh, evidence about uh, the potential impact of simulation on migrants' level market outcomes. And uh, we go, uh, go forward to look at the relationship uh, based on this empirical equation, where the Y the outcome, labor market outcomes of migrant I uh, from province P and now worked at the county C. And our main variable is uh, uh, identity assimilation, as I um, defined before. And uh, we control for individual characteristics, uh, which are mainly based on, uh, based on uh, before their migration to avoid some endogenous control, uh, endogenous issues. And uh, we also control for uh, destination county fixed effect and the original province fixed effect. And uh, in a robustness check, uh, we also control for original region and the destination province uh, county fixed effect. We cross the standard error within the uh, simple unit, which is a community of current residents. As I said, we use the linguistic distance between the home and the host places as instruments for a similarity, uh, for, for a simulation of migrants. Although this may uh, leave some concerns about exclusion restrictions, two main concerns may be, can be summarized as following. One is the communication effect of dialects. It is worth to emphasize that dialects, uh, as, as I talked about a little bit, uh, minutes later, uh, earlier, uh, actually, it's uh, many dialects, and uh, since in China, uh, Pudonghua uh, is quite popular uh, in at workplace, and based on uh, an independent survey, uh, there's uh, about over uh, over over eighty five percent of the labor force uh, at the can speak uh, Pudonghua, and uh, therefore. Uh, communication is not a problem for those migrants, even then they do not know local dialects. Uh, they can basically use Pudonghua for communication. And, but uh, we will provide further evidence about the potential uh, concerns relating to that uh, uh, the communication effect of linguistic distance. Uh, and the second issue is about sorting of migration. Uh, I will also talk about uh, this later. So, so uh, before that, I, I may for show, show you first about the sorting. So to look at the sorting of migration, we examine the relationship of individual characteristics and uh, the average uh, characteristics of the uh, 
uh, ethnicity as the, at the destination county. So we, uh, as expected, they are highly correlated uh, when we look at their law relationship. However, this association reduced substantially when we control for county fixed destination county fixed effect and the original province effects fixed effect. This indicate that uh, this uh, sorting are manifest on sorting uh, either they're coming from the same country with particular characteristics or the same destination may have some attractive features. But when we look at within county or uh, uh, destination county and origin profiles, this association is much smaller. And uh, this association is even smaller when we further controlling for original region by county fixed fat. Some of this association may even turn to be negative. And uh, we uh, we will provide more evidence about uh, the potential sorting may not be a serious concern for our identification. Four, four minutes, you. Sure. So uh, we'll look at the, the, the simple OS estimates of uh, identity assimilation with lab mark outcomes. We find that those assimilated migrants are more likely to get a high uh, hourly wage and having less working hours and uh, less likely to be overworked. And then we go to the RV estimates. First of all, linguist distance and uh, assimilation is significantly negatively created. Or in other words, uh, with, uh, when culture are more uh, similar, people are more easily to assimilate at the destination places. Utilizing this plausible exogenous variation in feasible uh, in, in assimilation, uh, we find the obvious may suggest that people who are assimilated uh, uh, will reduce their hourly wage, although it's marginally significant, and then uh, increasing the hourly wage and then reducing their uh, working time and then reducing the likelihood of, work, of being overworked. And we've done a lot of uh, robustness checks and uh, to do some plausible exogenity analysis and uh, do some plausible tests. We, all of them are confirmed that uh, the exclusion con uh, conditions are uh, to some extent uh, satisfied. And the correct for the sample selection due to uh, we focusing on early employees and the results remain robust. And uh, then we are going to look at uh, the potential mechanisms through which uh, identity of the social assimilation may affect labor market outcomes. Uh, we think it's potentially important for our understanding for the social assimilation process of the migrants. In our uh, conceptual framework, we consider when, when, when people come to a new places, they're feeling struggle, struggle to assimilate in terms of uh, self-identification. Uh, but uh, but uh, for uh, but uh, for native people, they, they usually have a uh, higher, uh, greater access to better jobs. So there's potential benefits to assimilated. Uh, how to uh, how they get there? Uh, we think uh, uh, the economic behavior, uh, the the behavior adjustment is important, particularly uh, the social interaction with local people and the neighborhood choice. And based on this interaction, the Built up networks with local people and get access to the labor market, uh, better uh, quality uh, jobs. And uh, as fortunately, we got a lot of measures uh, from this survey, and we find, based on our, our RV estimates, we find assimilated migrants is more likely to interact with local people, and they're less likely to interact with their own ethnic people and they are more likely to uh, reside with local people. Uh, the neighborhoods are mostly local people. And, uh, and uh, more direct evidence of this channel is that uh, we, we, the question asked the respondent how they get their job through which network. And we find for assumed migrants, they're more likely to get a job uh, uh, through uh, through net uh, local people, 
So we, we consider this is a, a, some somewhat a direct evidence uh, for the uh, for the uh, for the network plays an important role, especially local network plays an important role for migrants to get better jobs. And uh, we then look at uh, some heterogeneity about the impacts. We find that the impact uh, for 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 male and female, the impact uh, are somewhat different. Uh, for males, we observe uh, significant reduction, uh, increase in in wage and the reduction in work time. But for female, we mainly find the reduction in working time. And we didn't find any uh, difference in terms of uh, age cohort. For both young and old migrants, the impact are quite similar. And we also find some uh, differences for different education groups. For summarize, uh, this study using a linguistic distance as an instrument variable and study the impact of self-identity on labor market outcomes for uh, internal migrants in China. And we find it increased in the hourly wage and reducing the average uh, working hours and uh, also reducing the likelihood of being overworked. And we find uh, one potential very important uh, channel is through local network uh, by uh, intensive interaction with local people and then get jobs through uh, local, uh, local networks. That's all. Uh, thank you. Well, uh, comments are welcome. Thank you very much, Xu. Um, any questions, comments? Could I just uh, that get started? Um, one of the things, I mean, I don't know how um, the Chinese labor market is, but one of other things, for instance, in the UK um, is, or in London, for instance, there is this uh, different types of accents have different kind of meanings in a way attached to them. So there's a Cockney accent. And if you speak that kind of accent, then um, you're, you know, there's a perception of uh, about you, uh, you know, if, even if you're speaking to, to um, anyone. And so within the, the labor market, then, and that is, you know, they're more like working class or whatever, and, and they're, they're, they're looked into that because that's, that's the way the, 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 the um, stereotype has, has kind of established. And so I was just thinking in terms of the work kind of environment versus, uh, you know, within the dialects, is there anything that is linked to um, your background of the way you speak that determines in a way then your labor market outcomes as well? So it might, it might not be so to speak, the assimilation part, um, but that coming from this kind of perception in the labor market about your background, if you see yeah, what I mean. I think you, you mentioned some discrimination. Uh, yeah, it's true. Uh, for some places, for example, in Shanghai, the local people may have some perception when you have uh, accent and, uh, from uh, north, uh, north uh, from northern part of Jiangsu province. Which they call Subai, and they may have discrimination for these migrants. Uh, in in our, yes, we, in our analysis, we do consider the potential paralyzed uh, discrimination by controlling for the destination region and the host country fixed effect, which may partially account for the uh, particular uh, discrimination of the host local people to particular. Uh, migrants from particular region. Uh, and the, another evidence we think more convincing is that we look at, or we do some principal tests uh, for those new migrants, for those new migrants. We can, for, for, because we think social simulation may play an impact on uh, economic simulation is mainly because they get a network from local people. And uh, this takes time. Therefore, we will accept, expect this impact will be mostly those old migrants or those migrants have already lived in this, uh, in this hospital for a little bit while. And this may not be effective for new migrants. But for new migrants, they still have accent, right? For them, they also have accent. But we didn't observe significant uh, association of linguistic distance uh, and uh, the labor market outcome for this subgroup. This may provide some 
um, and reduce your concerns about yeah. the potential. Yes. Sure. Any other comments or questions? I mean, the other thing I was thinking was, I, I don't know if you oh. talked about it. May you? Sorry, somebody wants to say something? I'm so uh, sorry. Nancy, Nancy here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So just a very quick follow up of your question. Um, I was wondering, that how, did, did you control also whether those immigrants um, try to acquire the new dialogue or the new accent? So for example, when I was working in Shanghai, I actually tried to really mingle with uh, Shanghainese and learn a bit. And uh, I would say, yeah, that at least from my objective perspective, help a lot. Yes, exactly. Language, individual language skills or acquisition is also part of the simulation process of, of migrants. Uh, yes, we do take account of these uh, individual language skills of local dialects by counting for whether they can understand the local language, local dialects, mm -hmm. or, and uh, whether they can speak. So these right. are different, understand and speak are different. So we control them both together and our results remain, remain robust. Okay, I see, thank you. Thank you for your question. Any other comments? It might be interesting to think about some about the business owners in the local community and whether they have roots in the origin area um, and therefore would be more comfortable with those dialects or languages. Um, I don't know if you can get data on that at all. Um, so whether they basically go to work for somebody and who would understand them. And if there's just more business owners who would understand them and therefore they get better outcomes. You mean those business uh, owners are from the same uh, uh, from the same home county, a home province, right? Or their parents were okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, exactly. This uh, we we take account of the potential stock of uh, ethnic network at the destination places uh, by. Or in a robustness check, we do analyze the potential impact of the ethnic network at the destination places. But, and but, but, but the, the core argument is: is the, is the, is the, is the, the general Chinese is understood by everybody, by any by everybody. The so dialect is not necessary to to, to communicate. Right, but you could just think that if the business owners, the ones who are doing the employment and you know and wage decisions, are identifying with you more or more sympathetic to you, maybe um, then you're just going to have better outcomes. So it's more than just the network; it's the kind of the power of the network um, and the ability to give jobs and to hire. Mm -hmm. Anyway, just a thought. Yeah, no, th th that's kind of connection to that that area that you know people from that area kind of thing. So that that's the idea there. Um, mm -hmm. But but yeah, um, okay. So we have to to stop here. Uh, those are something th some of the things. I mean, the other thing I, I wanted to mention. I, I don't want you to answer that, but uh, I assume that you control for this uh, because there is a hukou system as well and stuff like that. And I'm sure. Um, you, you control for those kind of things um, where people cannot work from a different region uh, when they migrate uh, because of the hukou, um, hukou restrictions. But, uh, but but I'll stop. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Maybe if we have time at the end. Uh, okay, so not uh, <laughs> rather last, but no, by no means least, um, we go to Teresa. So we are going to uh, stick with this uh, identity assimilation story. Uh, and also um, as being in Europe, we didn't want to be left uh, left out of the, <laughs> the region. So we are going to talk about uh, Italy uh, uh, in the last uh, presentation. Uh, over to you.
Thank you so much. So first of all, I would like to thank Matlou for the invitation. It's really a pleasure to be to be here for me today and uh, make my best uh, wishes to Glass birthday. So uh, this project is a joint project with uh, Matlou. Here we investigate whether ethnic identity, which for us is feeling assimilated to the Italian cultures, has an effect on the educational aspiration of school of uh, school going children. Of, uh, of immigrants. So uh, now there is a growing uh, literature, a new growing literature on the role that ethnic identity plays on uh, immigrants' uh, economic outcome. Yesterday we have uh, a couple of papers that we, we they were looking at uh, the, the problem that uh, uh, immigrants with low commitment to the host uh, country culture have worse uh, employment and um, economic outcomes. Uh, so employment opportunities and economic outcomes. So the, the idea here is, is, is that immigrants uh, um, are relevant not only in uh, as a share of the labor force for many developed countries, including Italy, but they have also a higher fertility rate compared to, uh, to natives. And uh, uh, so uh, children, so immigrants, uh, children, uh, they will be the future labor uh, labor force. And therefore, uh, it's also important to understand uh, which type of uh, educational investment they make, because this will contribute to determine their economic uh, outcome. So to, to the best of our knowledge, there are no studies that really consider the role that ethnic identity can play in the performance and aspiration of school going uh, children of immigrants. We found uh, uh, three related uh, papers. The first one is next by 2009 uh, that uh, in Sweden uh, analyze uh, a correlation between uh, acculturation and um, educational attainment, but they focus only on those or immigrants who complete uh, university education. Uh, using the German data, Schuller 2015 explored this correlation between parental ethnic identity and children educational outcome, finding that uh, uh, children uh, educational outcome improve when parents are better uh, assimilated. We are uh, always talking about um, immigrants uh, sample. And then there is uh, a closer related paper, which is uh, Carlana et al. 2022, uh, published just in Econometrica. They use uh, Italian data called Invalsi, and they show that uh, immigrants uh, pupil are more likely um, to enroll to, uh, into vocational or technical education rather than what we call academically oriented school. Uh, in Italy, we call this liceo and uh, compared to native with the same ability level. So they call this, uh, this phenomenon um, educational uh, segregation. And we, we, we wanted to explore, we may uh, think that uh, this is linked to social network and, uh, um, and identity. So that can explain why there is this educational segregation between immigrants and, uh, and Italians. So uh, we think that this is so therefore important to, uh, to understand uh, to what extent really identity can play a role in uh, educational uh, investment and, uh, and outcome. So the literature provides us with two measures of ethnic identity, uh, the self-identification measure, whether you know I feel from the host or I feel from the origin country. So in our case, I feel Italian or not. And then uh, uh, Glaus and uh, Constant, uh, they, they developed the ethnocyzer uh, that is an index uh, with five components uh, in which uh, the self-identification measure is part of the, of the component. So is, um, we have a, a different component, including the ethnic, uh, sorry, there is um, a type here, the ethnic uh, self-identification, language, culture, migration, history, and social network. Most probably you are familiar with this, it's just that we use them the simple version, the version, the one dimensional ethnocyzer, because we cannot, uh, like the data allowed us only to, to construct this. So this is a continuous index going from zero to one, which is uh, um, zero if uh, uh, immigrants are fully committed to the host uh, country, in our case, uh, Italy, and uh, one if they are committed to their origin uh, country. Okay, this has been taken from Blau's paper. 
Okay, so in this paper, what we do, we study the impact of ethnic identity on educational preference of children of immigrants in Italy. We have uh, um, our sample, uh, we construct the analysis for students, uh, immigrant students, uh, that they are at the moment in middle secondary school and high secondary school, okay? And uh, we, what we find is uh, that a low commitment to the Italian culture has a negative effect on uh, students who are in the high secondary school uh, in their aspiration to enroll at the university. So uh, just a, a brief roadmap of the presentation. I will uh, um, introduce the study context and data, then uh, empirical framework, uh, uh, result and uh, conclusions. This is still a work in progress, okay? So just for those who are not uh, familiar with the um, Italian educational system, uh, school is compulsory from the age of six to the age of 16. And the pre-university education comprises five years of primary school, three years of this uh, middle, uh, middle uh, school, middle high school, and then five years of uh, high school. So primary and middle schools are homogeneous in their track. And then <clears throat> at the end of the um, middle secondary school, the students need to decide what type of high school they wanted to attend academically oriented, technical, vocational, after the high secondary school, whether to enroll or not at the university, okay? So uh, we, uh, our data are from the integration of second generation survey conducted in 2015 by the National Institute of Statistics that is called ISTAT. It's just a simple cross-section. We have, uh, um, they consider a large number of uh, uh, schools, uh, 1,419, for a total number of students interviewed that were 68,127, both Italian and immigrants. But we focus only on immigrants with foreign citizenship, okay? And uh, our sample consists of more than 26,000 students, more than 12,000 are in middle secondary school and almost 14,000 are in high secondary school. Let me say that in Italy, we have uh, around 1 million students uh, with a foreign background and they represent the 10% of the students' uh, uh, population. Okay. <clears throat> Going to the, uh, to the data. So our uh, dependent uh, variable is um, for those who are in the middle school, the preference uh, for, uh, um, for the type of high secondary school in which uh, they wanted to, to enroll, whether it is uh, uh, um, an academically oriented school, technical, vocational, or, um, or other. Sorry, one second. And then, for those who are at the, in the high secondary school, whether they wanted to enroll or not at the uh, university. We have our control that are the, um, our variable of interest, this is the ethnic identity. Then we have school information, pupil characteristics, household characteristics and location. Just to have a feel of some of the variables that we are um, considering, we have uh, whether <clears throat> the degree in which the student is enrolled, then the um, student's uh, performance when uh, um, they started the Italian school. We have a bunch of uh, pupil characteristics, gender, whether they have been born in Italy. If they practice a sport, uh, they work, uh, and then a bunch of household uh, characteristics, uh, including uh, parental uh, education. And then we have uh, this kind of uh, family wealth index uh, um, that is uh, uh, constructed with the principal component analysis. Maybe if we have time, I will go through it. Okay. So we tried here to be um, rigorous uh, um, to construct the exercise as in uh, uh, Glau's paper 
we were lucky uh, to have um, all the components. <clears throat> and um, so we have uh, information on whether, uh, um, uh, how well they speak, uh, um, uh, understand, uh, read, write Italian. The idea is that um, the variable is going to be zero if there is a very good ability in Italian, and uh, one if they have a very poor ability in Italian. Web information culture, uh, the language used for thinking, for example, or migration history, and uh, whether they wish to live in Italy or not, and then uh, um, social network, whether they have uh, uh, Italian friends that they meet outside the uh, outside school. <laughs> Going to the um, empirical analysis, we um, uh, investigate the relationship between uh, ethnic identity and school outcome uh, using a, um, a simple regression model. We have uh, our outcome variable uh, for respondent I in school J, and which is for those, as I say again, for those who are in the middle school, the type of uh, high school in which they would like to enroll, for those who are at the university, what if they wanted to enroll at the university or not, okay? We look at them separately. <clears throat> Our variable of interest, uh, that is both the um, variable self-reported and the index, uh, the ethnocyzer, the bunch of controls, regional controls, and error component. Uh, of course, uh, given that we are in a um, cross-sectional setting, uh, estimating the model using uh, uh, a linear probability model can be problematic uh, for the problem of unobservable that can affect both our outcome and uh, variable of interest. So we try to implement uh, um, an instrumental variable approach, uh, and our instrument is uh, the distance, uh, the language distance. So we have uh, um, a question asking uh, which type of language do you speak uh, with your parents, which is the language that you speak with your parents. We have both the first language uh, that most for the 48% uh, of the sample is Italian, and then a second language that is a foreigner language. Okay, so we try to, to use, uh, to, to take the distance, uh, using the ethnologue, uh, and is uh, a value between zero to 100 to the Italian language as a proxy for, uh, uh, for culture. Uh, of course, uh, we, we will control uh, whether they speak or not Italian at home. So um, we have, these are the um, the result for uh, um, the, the sample of the goes in middle school. So this is the aspiration for high secondary school. This is the first stage. The <clears throat> language uh, distance has the expected uh, sign. So higher is the distance uh, from uh, the language spoken to the parent to, to, to uh, at home with the parents. Uh, higher is the ethnicizer and the ethnic uh, identity. So you are uh, less assimilated uh, to the Italian culture. And uh, controlling also for speaking Italian at home, which has also the correct sign, because uh, if you speak Italian at home, you, uh, are, you, you are more assimilated to the, to the Italian culture. Then we control for school information, to be characteristics of the, the, the control that we have. And uh, uh, this table uh, seems quite big, but what uh, for the those who, who are uh, uh, so we are different tracks, and um, for those who, uh, who are in the middle school and need to decide what type of high uh, secondary school they wanted to attend, when we move from uh, a, a linear probability model that captures correlation to an instrumental variable approach. Here, uh, we use a three stage least square because we have different choices that the students can make, and therefore, the error terms are correlated. So, we find uh, that identity uh, does not really explain the choice uh, uh, from a school to another school. And this seems that most is driven by household characteristics. For example, students use, uh, choose an academic uh, track uh, if um, their uh, parental education uh, increases, so is higher. 
So, and uh, it's really important also um, like having a degree, family uh, wealth index uh, is, is important. It's important if they speak um, Italian at home, if they have been born uh, in Italy. And it seems that girls uh, uh, more uh, uh, are more likely to use uh, to, to choose an academically oriented track, and of course perform as a school. So if they have a, a higher grade, um, this seems to to go for an academically oriented track. There are many control, uh, and I just wanted to uh, point out some. While uh, uh, when we move uh, to the result for uh, the sample uh, that at the moment is in high secondary school uh, and need to decide whether to go to the uh, university or not, the intention to enroll at the university, again, uh, uh, the, the instrument has the expected uh, <clears throat> sign. Just uh, um, uh, what we, we find... Um, here is the for the aspiration for uh, for university is that uh, uh, we find that uh, if you are less assimilated to the Italian culture, you are less likely to uh, enroll at the university. Okay, this all across uh, the different uh, specification. So four minutes. Four minutes, Reza. Okay, so we have uh, um, both for the ethnic, uh, so the self-report and the ethnocizer, this uh, uh, negative sign, uh, it, it, we use a linear probability model. We use two types of instruments. So the first is a more restricted instrument, uh, which is we, uh, so uh, whether the students uh, report uh, the language spoken at home, there is a 6% uh, of our sample which do not report the language uh, uh, spoken at home. So we try to impute, uh, knowing the um, or origin country, so we try to impute using uh, the most common language spoken uh, in that country. So both uh, um, also with the imputation, uh, we see that uh, result uh, old. I just wanted to show uh, some, uh, uh, of course, uh, the, the, the choices of going and enrolling at the university really depend, of course, also. So the, the, the story of the um, uh, identity, all that we control for a, for a bunch of characteristics, school characteristics, of course, uh, students improve the probability to enroll at the university if uh, uh, they perform well at, well at school. If uh, uh, they have a good experience at school, uh, they trust their teacher, they feel appreciated by teacher, why they decrease the, the, the intention to enroll at the university if they started the Italian school late, or if they are repeating, so this, there is a great uh, retention. And uh, also for, uh, it seems that uh, we mm, female students uh, are more likely to want to enroll at the university, whether uh, if they practice a sport, this is also a social uh, measure, and uh, they are less likely if they um, work. And also it's important the family background because both uh, parental education wealth index really um, shape the, the decision to, to enroll, uh, the intention to enroll at the university or not. We also uh, look at uh, um, the, the an heterogeneous analysis for uh, uh, boys and girls. Uh, and what is uh, interesting is when we decompose our sample, the result uh, seems driven by girls. So it seems that girls uh, in uh, any specification are those who are uh, uh, affected by identity in the sense that uh, if uh, uh, they are less assimilated, they seem to pay more of the price in the sense that they are less uh, intention to enroll uh, at the university. And this all the, considering the, the fact that normally, uh, you know, there is a, a, gen a gender story here in the sense that uh, um, you know, normally the girls uh, uh, pay more for being less assimilated. In Italy, uh, most of, uh, uh, of the immigration comes from uh, um, developing, uh, developing countries, which the, the women condition. Uh, um, so there is a lot of discrimination uh, uh, toward women. 
So uh, these were the, the results that I wanted to uh, underline. So um, in conclusion, uh, we, we find that we didn't show all the results, but we find that uh, um, identity is really shaped by time spent in Italy, school experience, and performance, family characteristic and location. They really contribute to shaping identity. We do not find any impact of children identity on um, the choice of the high secondary schools. So for those who are in the middle school, the choice of um, the type of track of high secondary school in which they wanted to enroll. But we find that a weak sense of Italian identity decreased the preference for enrolling at the university. And uh, this is strongly for, uh, for girl. Uh, we think this is quite relevant because uh, um, in, in the future, uh, uh, Italian uh, um, pupils, immigrant pupils, they will be a part of the Italian labor force. Thank you. Okay, perfect timing. Thank you, uh, Teresa. Questions, comments? Yeah, that problem with my voice. I hope it didn't affect yeah. the presentation. Yeah, class. I have to unmute me. Now, um, the identity performance in, in Italy, um, you looked at uh, family characteristics and so on. Now, did you do you have data for um, uh, country of origin experiences if these are migrants who, who are coming in to the country? We are, uh, so this is our children, so it's second generation migrants. So we okay. have the, the origin and country of their uh, uh, mother and father. Some of them, they have been born in Italy. Uh, some of them, uh, they, they born abroad in their origin country. Uh, so we control for, for that in the shipping um, identity. Uh, just uh, um, uh, the descriptive. Uh, uh, okay, the point was more like, I mean, if, if if somebody comes into the country and has already schooling uh, at at uh, in the country of origin, then that that in our experience that would dominate experience in 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 uh, or even schooling in uh, in in the in the host country. But if these are all uh, kids of um, yes. Previous previous migrants, yes, and that is not a good. That's not a valid point. But what I'm making, okay? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Anything else? Uh, any other comments, suggestions? Could I could I then ask a question? Yes. Uh, for um, to to the audience uh, for a little bit of our. And how should we present this thing? Because one of the things that uh, we talked about was uh, uh, the two instruments. One is the language. I mean, generally, the language uh, distance when you're looking at people don't have the information of the language they speak at home, or sometimes at least there isn't. And so the, the idea is to kind of impute, so to speak, based on where they come from. But we showed here, I think, Teresa, you showed both of them, didn't you? Um, Yes, 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 the restricted so version in which- Do, do you think we can know. just, sh we should just, just show the uh, the language spoken at home, which is, which should address the uh, the point or do we, should we show both of them to make a, make a comparison, so to speak? Any, um, any thoughts on that or, or you think it's, uh, it's better to kind of- well, I mean, what, is, what, what is the exclusion restriction here? Okay, so basically, uh, for uh, so there is this question asking uh, which language do you speak at home uh, with your parents? Uh, so the first one would be Italian, for example, and then there is the second language spoken. Then there is um, uh, six, uh, seven percent of the sample which uh, do not report uh, the language spoken at home; they say other, and then we imputed uh, using uh, the information on the origin country imputing uh, the, the most common language spoken in the um, in the origin country. Of course, we cannot be 100% sure that that is the language spoken, especially for some countries in which uh, more languages are spoken. So we, we, we take uh, the, the official language in that case. 
Well, it does not seem that uh, the imputation has uh, any particular effect. So I could, this, is, this is safe, this. Uh, maybe uh, one, uh, one idea I was uh, having is, I don't know if you can use the cohort of entry in schools of, of, the, of these kids, let's say to see some heterogeneity, or one, maybe one, if, one thing could be if kids enter in Italian school at year five or at uh, 12, uh, 12 years old, maybe the identity or the effects of the vertical transmission from parents to children as a differential, uh, may have a differential effects on, on the performance at school of these kids. This may be an, an idea to look at the uh, age of entering the school, how many years they stay in the schools, and yeah. so on and so forth. We control for that, but we didn't do a separate analysis. So we can create a threshold and see before. You, you, yeah, you can use some, uh, some thresholds and look by, by groups or by interaction or, or something like this. Can I? Can I ask yeah, sure. from the yes, point again? Because I don't think it was, uh, we, we, we understood each other. Now, uh, you have two equations, basically. Yes, uh, the final equation is that educational achievement is, uh, is, is controlled by identity, yes? Yes. Okay, and you have a regression explaining identity. Yes. And you want to instrument that, yes? Okay. Yes. And for this instrument, uh, you use language distance, okay? Uh, that's what you're showing here in this table. And that's as such as, as the first stage is fine. However, the question is, show me back the table, yes, okay? Uh, yes. Now, is this language distance, this, this is not allowed to affect educational attainment directly. That's the exclusion restriction. Mm. Yes, and if this is not the, if, if if there are doubts on this, then the the whole approach is 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 wrong. But we claim because we we control whether they speak Italian at home. So speaking Italian at home affect your uh, uh, both your I identity and. Uh... That's not how a referee would look at this. Uh, I mean, forget about it. Speaking at telecom is, is fine. It's another, it's another. This is a different story because this is also endogenous. I mean, it's okay. So you claim that language distance is an instrument. Yes? It's a proxy for, for origin culture. Well, you claim it, you say it's IV. So you claim uh, this is an instrument. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. And the. the, the to, to be a valuable instrument for ethnic identity, it has to be uncorrelated language, has to be language distance, has to be uncorrelated with, uh, the, uh, um, if, with the educational attainment. That's what is called the exclusion restriction. Yeah. Okay, now, um, this is not a matter of statistics. As such, you cannot look at the regression because uh, uh, it is impossible to, 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 to formally test it in a simple way, but you have to make plausible that this is not, this is not, not correlated. And if uh, you cannot convince the referee of this, then the paper will not be accepted in a, in a journal which wants causality, yes? Did I make yes. my point? No, no, I understand your point. M my initial point was that it's true. But given that we absorb that effect with the controlling for speaking Italian at home and school performance, we absorb directly that effect. Yeah, I I, I'm telling you, I am telling okay. you, this is, yeah, this is nice. To, 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 this is a robustness test, yes? Um, fine. Uh, it, it's good that you, you're doing it, but it doesn't rule out the issue is, 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 do you have causality at the end? I'm, I'm not saying we should, I mean, because at the end of the day, uh, this is a matter of, uh, well, that you are convinced of this or not. It's more about the story you can tell. There, is no, there are lots of tests which, which you can do to, to, to show that it's, it's robust or, not so on, or if a problem not so relevant and so on. There's a huge literature going on, but, it's, but that's the point. Insofar, insofar I mean, 
uh, that's my problem I, ha I see here at the moment. Okay. If you don't care about causalities, that's fine. To say it's correlation. Yeah, I think we have to kind of tighten up the language in terms of how it's how it, it is coming across. <clears throat> You just look at, I mean, that's, that's just my advice. I mean, yeah, no, no, that's, that's, that's useful advice. Maybe yeah. if I can just add something to what he was saying is that <clears throat> there are some studies that look at how distance from, in this case, from uh, language uh, from Italy, Italian language, or in other case, uh, cultural distance may affect human capital accumulation. Let, let's suppose you, you come from a country with the or ancestry adjusted the long term orientation or other cultural stuff. In this case, difference between groups, original groups, so uh, also in the distance, cultural linguistic distance may affect directly the educational performance and so the exclusion of restrictions is violated in this case. Yeah. Okay. What you should check, you could check redoing the, the first stage and uh, reduced form by groups of a country based on uh, how much how, how much do they are distant from the Italian language and see if there are some particular pattern in this sense to just convey the idea that there is no much heterogeneity or there is some group that drives the, the story. This is just to give some sense, but there is no, as Klaus was saying, formal test that you can show to this theoretical argument that you need to, to ensure. Thank you. Thank you for your suggestion for improving our work. Thank you. Okay, I think we should stop here. Thanks uh, to everyone for uh, comments and, and suggestions. Um,